Hello, and thank you for including me in the Scaling Biochar Forum. I'd like to talk with you about a potentially very powerful way to scale biochar across the landscape by engaging people from all walks of life in hands-on biochar production. One way to do this would be to create a new CCC, a carbon conservation core, to reconnect people to the land. Let's start where I live, the Pacific Northwest. In terms of ecosystem carbon storage, the old growth forests here are certainly the greatest forests on planet Earth. Unfortunately, much has been lost due to clear-cut logging, and more is being lost now from climate-driven wildfires. The problem of wildfire in the West is more complicated than just clear-cut logging and global heating. It also has a lot to do with fire suppression and fire management. These forests are meant to burn on a regular basis, and by aggressively suppressing every fire over the last hundred years, we have inadvertently created a tinderbox. The solution needs to start with thinning small trees and brush in the wildland urban interface, or the WUI, to protect homes and businesses. Then we need to look at the landscape and thin strategic fire breaks to further protect communities and the remnant old growth forests that we have. Then when the landscape is properly prepared, we can reintroduce fire through prescribed burning. And for guidance, we can look to the landscape burning practices of the first best stewards of this land, the Native Americans who still practice and teach their techniques. But there's another reason to return fire to the landscape that is ecological. These are fire adapted forests and charcoal is a natural component of forest soils. Up to 50% of the carbon in our forest soils is charcoal. And um, if you, when scientists have looked at the recent soil horizons uh, since aggressive fire suppression, they're finding that a large part of that charcoal component is missing in many places. This has unknown consequences for forest health. Here's something interesting that I found in my own backyard. This bag of biochar was sitting in my yard for about a year, and I went to empty it out one day to use it, and I found all these roots coming up through the bottom of the bag from those nearby pine tr trees, and I wondered why they would do that. And as I dug through those roots, I could see that all these fine root hairs are penetrating into the char pores. And maybe they're after water. Um, this was an uncharged biochar, so who knows? Maybe they just liked the minerals. But anyway, um, it's obvious to me that trees want char, and I think we should give it to them. So uh, as global heating continues to drive ecological changes in our forest ecosystems, we need to do whatever we can to increase forest health and resilience, and biochar could well be part of that. Um, and in anticipation of these changes, we need to realize that we're going to see a shift away from the cool, more moist evergreen forests that we have known towards more hardwood forests and mixed forests. And hopefully char could help uh, keep those forests strong and healthy anticipating that change. So one of the things that we can do is improve the health of the oak savannas. This project, for instance, in Lane County is thinning out the small firs and pines that have been choking the big old oak trees. These oak trees are generally more resistant to heat and drought, and so they're an important place to protect. Then we have the problem of the conifer plantations that have replaced the, a lot of the original old growth forests. They need thinning, both for forest health and fuels reduction. When small trees are cut, they're piled and burned for disposal um, using a technique called the jackpot burn pile. And these jackpot piles are carefully constructed so they won't fall apart. They're designed to completely incinerate the material as they burn down to ash, they also burn the organic forest soil horizon underneath, killing all the soil life and leaving nothing but minerals and rocks. These incinerated spots, and sometimes there could be hundreds of them in an acre, can take years to recover. And if they're on sloping ground, they can create erosion problems. 
So a few years ago, we started to think about alternatives to the conventional pile burning that would save the soil and make biochar, and we developed several techniques for making biochar in an open flame. This first technique is very simple. You light the piles on top, so the flame burns the smoke, and at the end, you just put it out with water to save the char. So here I am looking at a pile that we burned the year before to see what's there now. And here's what I saw. All these herbs, orchids, mushrooms happily growing there right up through the char. Um, what a benefit. So how does this work? We always hear that biochar is made in the absence of air, so how can flame carbonization work to make biochar? The key here is to understand that biomass burns in stages. Then the first stage is dehydration, when you heat wood, water vapor is driven off first. That's followed by all the volatile gases that contain hydrogen and oxygen. Those are driven off by the heat. And this is the gas that actually burns in a flame. Now once that gas is gone and the flame dies down, you're left with char. And char burns in a completely different manner because it's a solid fuel. It doesn't make a flame, it just glows. And this is the point where you can save the char before it burns to ash. And you do this by cutting off the air. You can also see in the picture here of the log how we need to burn the outer portion of the log to provide the heat to char the inner portion. This illustrates why flame carbonization works best with smaller brush and branches. Big logs are hard to char all the way through and they're not a fire danger, so we can just leave those in the woods. Now we can also improve the efficiency of the process by using a simple, simple container. Uh, the Japanese kilns are where I first got the idea for making flame cap kilns. The diagram here shows how it works. With the flame on top, it radiates heat down into the unburned material and chars it. All the air to feed the flame comes from above, so there's no air present underneath to burn the char. And this container can be almost any shape, including a hole in the ground. So here's the first kiln that I developed and manufactured. We called it the Oregon kiln because it's tough and you can drag it out into the woods and really beat it up. The low profile makes it easier to load it up with wood and has a solid bottom that you can flood quench and then drain. Now this ring of fire kiln here shows how the countercurrent airflow works and it um, keeps that flame low down on top of the fuel for better heat transfer and combustion dynamics. Operationally in the field, one of the biggest issues is quenching. And water is the easiest way to cool and save the char, but water is not always available or not always available in the quantities you would want it. Fortunately, we have other options. If we just have a small amount of water, we can rake the char thin so it loses heat, and then we can put it out with less water. Or we can snuff it using a simple metal lid, and then we just have to wait for it to cool down. So over the past few years, I've been traveling around the country doing workshops, teaching people these flame carbonization techniques, and I think I've reached more than 2,000 people firsthand at these workshops. But uh, one of the most interesting trips that I've taken was to Paradise, California last January, and I think you all know what happened there in 2018. Professor Steve Fair of Butte Community College invited me, and we did a week of biochar demonstrations at various places, helping landowners deal with some of the dead wood left behind after the fire. The Butte Fire Safe Council was also involved, and it was really great to see this news report um, in February showing how the techniques are catching on. So let me share this with you now. Green biomass material that experts say is more environmentally friendly is starting to catch on in the Campfire Burn Sky area. Reporter Michael Patterson went to the biochar burn demonstration near Megalia to show us why it's gaining so much popularity. Right now, there are thousands of pounds of this biomass in and around the Campfire Burn Scar, and fire professionals in the area are looking at a cost-effective and more environmentally friendly way of disposing of it. That method is a burn pile but done so from a top-down approach, creating a carbon-rich byproduct which promotes vegetation growth in soil. 
Preston England studied at Butte College and has become somewhat of an expert on biochar burning. He says a top-down burn is more eco-friendly than a bottom-up burn because less greenhouse gas is emitted into the air. As the, the fire is burning down, the smoke is going back into the flames and it's recombusting, separating the molecules, so it's mostly hydrogen that you see getting burned right there. England demoed the biochar burn method to local residents and the Butte County Fire Safe Council. The council is hoping the method catches on because it could improve long-term forest health. So that biochar is full of all of these opportunities for nutrients and uh, soil enhancement and water absorption and all types of things that are going to be beneficial. The council also sees the method as a way to save money. Instead of having to ship the biomass to a processing facility, it can be done at home. You got access to water. You got access to the material to burn it and a way to start a fire. You got it. You know, you can do it. Anybody can do it. Um, but my overall goal is to make it more known. The council says it is looking into creating a program that would allow them to transport these kilns to people's properties to allow them to burn in their own backyard. Reporting from the Ridge, Michael Patterson, KRCR News Channel 7, the North States News. So then in March, the coronavirus hit and all my workshops were canceled and I had time on my hands. I, had, I wanted to improve the Ring of Fire kiln, so I took some time and designed a new version with an integrated heat shield, and I had a couple of them made. Meanwhile, all the kids in my neighborhood were home from school with nothing to do, so they were happy to get out in the, in the fresh air and help me test them out with the neighbor's burn piles. And so um, this was a great project. We were able to stay socially distant, so it felt safe. So let me show you this short video that I made describing the project. Yes. See, that's one good thing about not burning the pile. We're not killing the animals that are living in it. If we just let it off, some of them might get burned up. Hello. Can I twist it open more? Now, um, hold, hold it back away because it can backfire on you. So you want to be about a foot away. How do you, how do you stop the burning? Hose in the water. You're just gonna spray it on top and then... Yeah, yeah, mix it around, spray the next layer. Then you take it apart and then load it and spray it as you put it into the Listos? Listas? Do it! It's the only way to get it cooled down enough. Right, if it's in a pack, then there's not enough surface area.
Okay, so this is the Ring of Fire kiln, and I'm now selling it. I have a manufacturer in um, over near Medford who's making them for me, and we're getting ready to ship. One of the best things that I think I like about this kiln, besides the fact that it seems to be more efficient than other kilns, is that no single piece of it weighs more than 40 pounds. So anyone can um, take it apart, put it back together, load it in a truck, and move it around. So um, you know, if you want to be the first on your block to get one of these, go to my website right now and order one or, or order 10 or, or more and um, spread them around your neighborhood. Give them to your local fire safe council or your conservation district. And um, this is the tool. So now that we have these reasonably priced um, effective biochar kilns that anyone can use, now, how are we going to get them out in the landscape and get the work done? Because making biochar is a lot of work. And how are we going to afford to pay for the labor? Well, the first thing to understand is that we're already paying a lot of money to reduce fuels using the cut, pile, and burn method. And this chart compares the cost of the current practice with a biochar alternative that we are calling cut, char, and quench. And as you can see, the biggest cost of the current practice is the piling. It takes a lot of time to construct those tight jackpot piles. And so what I propose is that instead of piling, we use that labor to gather up the brush and slash and put it directly into the kilns. The cost may not be exactly the same, but I think it could be pretty close. So what we need at this point really is more demonstration projects so we can figure out more precisely what the costs are. And at the same time, we need to start uh, looking at the benefits and valuing those, especially the climate impact. The Ring of Fire kiln can make two cubic yards of biochar in one eight hour workday. Assuming one cubic yard of biochar weighs 200 pounds, you can make then 400 pounds per day or one ton per week. And we can use this simple rule of thumb thumb, one ton of biochar is equivalent to two and a half tons of sequestered CO2. Since the average American emits about 20 tons of CO2 per year, you could then sequester your own emissions working eight weeks a year making biochar in the field. All right, here's the thing, we're in a crisis and a lot of people are feeling hopeless in the face of so many huge problems. But I want to remind us all that we have done this before. In the depths of the, the Great Depression, when millions were out of work and the Dust Bowl was destroying the heartland, President Roosevelt started the Civilian Conservation Corps. The CCC worked to heal the land and it put food on the tables of starving people. If we could do it back then, why can't we do it now? Can we train an army of tree workers? Can we train an army of biochar, biochar technicians like these students from Chico State and Butte Community College? Let's create a new CCC, a Carbon Conservation Corps to do the work and pay our youth to sequester carbon. And there's so many other benefits besides the ecological benefits. CCC workers will learn teamwork and they will gain physical fitness. And most important, by sequestering carbon, they're doing something directly to combat climate change. This leads to a sense of purpose and hope for the future. We're starting them young here in Oregon. In July, we held a bio, biochar STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math day camp for middle school students. It was a lot of fun. Uh, the kids had a great time. I had a great time. We learned a lot about um, science and math. Biochar is a great topic for that. And you can read all about it on my blog at wilsonbiochar.com. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you'd like to learn more about these ideas, please visit my website, wilsonbiochar.com. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much.